This is Dune Talk, a DuneNewsNet.com production. Join us now for the latest Dune news, reactions, and lively discussions. Hey there. This week we have a special episode of Dune Talk. The story of Dune has inspired generations of readers, as well as the writers of so many works, books, film, TV, games that have come afterwards. Author Frank Herbert in turn spent years researching for the creation of his original Dune novel and was influenced by many historical and contemporary figures. In a new book, The Worlds of Dune, the places and cultures that inspired Frank Herbert, author Tom Huddleston dives into the many fascinating real world cultures, people, and locations that became a part of this enduring story that we all know and love. And we're really excited to have Tom on the show with us today. This is Marcus, your editor at dunewsnet.com, and I'm here with co-hosts uh, Garen and Mark, both who have done their share of exploration into the history and lore of uh, the Dune saga. Hey, it's Garen. Uh, really excited to, to be a part of this interview and to talk to Tom Huddleston. Uh, I, I've always loved the background and the history and the inspiration uh, that came into the, the epic that I love so much, which is the Dune series. So really excited to dig in and, and, and understand uh, a lot of what Tom already knows and what he can share with us. Hi, Mark from Dune Info here. Uh, glad to be joining the gang again to talk Dune. Uh, yet another Dune book. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to Tom about the history of Frank Herbert's Dune and peeling away the layers of all the real life inspiration that Frank Herbert took when creating his masterpiece. So yes, uh, Tom is our special guest today. He's a film and TV writer whose work has appeared on publications such as The Guardian and Little White Lies. He's also written sci-fi and fancy books for younger readers, including a six book uh, Star Wars series. Uh, Tom, welcome to Dune Talk. I uh, wanted to give you the opportunity to tell our viewers and listeners a bit more about you. Uh, how would you describe yourself, whether it's like personal or, or work, in, in a minute? Uh, I guess I describe myself as an author primarily, um, which uh, is, is kind of a cool thing to be able to describe yourself as. Um, my focus is uh, largely on, on, on writing fiction. Um, as you said, I've written a number of sci-fi and fantasy stories for, for younger readers. Um, I've written, as you said, some, some, some Star Wars fiction, um, some Warhammer fiction, but also my own original um, trilogy, the Flood World trilogy, which is set um, in a kind of future flooded post-climate change London. Um, and uh, I also used to um, work on the film desk at Time Out magazine in London, uh, worked there for a long time. And since leaving there, I've done um, a bunch of freelance film and TV writing for the likes of The Guardian and Little White Lies. And, and it was an article um, for the latter that led me to write um, my first nonfiction, full length nonfiction book, uh, The World of Dune. And here it is. <laughs> Nice, and that, that's a beautiful edition of full, full color, a lot of uh, nice photographs in, in that. Um, Tom, since, since you're the first time guest on Dune Talk, uh, we'd like to hear about your Dune story. How did you get, uh, in, um, I guess, introduced to, to Dune? Well, well, I have a very vivid memory. Um, I must have been 10 or 11 years old. Um, my dad lived in Manchester uh, in the north of England, and um, I was visiting with him, I think he was staying with some friends of his, and um, I just finished reading *The Lord of the Rings* um, for the first time, and I and I'd kind of raced through it, and it, it you know blown my my tiny mind. And I, I remember saying to to my dad, like, "Is there anything else, you know, uh, uh, similar? So something, you know, what what else can I read that's kind of big and 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 gonna gonna grab me?" And I remember his friend Jed saying, "Why don't you give him June?" And I thought he was saying June, like the month, um, or, or the, the you know the, the, an old lady's name. So I was like, oh, I'm not sure. I love the sound of this June. Um, but he came back with um, the, the the you know the classic three book uh, original June the kind of classic June trilogy. Um, it's got a huge sandworm on the cover, um, and uh, it's this huge chunky hardback. And I thought, okay, I'll give this a go much too young to understand it. I mean, you know, The Lord of the Rings is, is is a book for adults, but it's definitely the kind of thing a kid can wrap their head around. You know, there's nothing particularly adult about it. 
Um, June, on the other hand, uh, a very different story. So, you know, there's, there's, there's some pretty horrific stuff going on in, in June, as, as, as you're well aware. Um, so, I, but, you know, I wanted to impress my dad. So I read the whole thing. I don't know how much of it I understood. I think I got about, I definitely read the whole of the first book. I probably got 20 or 30 pages into June Messiah before going, okay, this is, this is way too much for me. Um, and then I, 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 my next exposure to it would have been would have been the, the Lynch film. So I would have been eight when that came out. Um, so it would have been on TV, I think, that I would have seen it for the first time, probably late 80s. And I remember finding the world building amazing, but being quite upset by quite a lot of it. Certainly the um, the heart plugs. I remember that scene uh, very vividly with with um, with Kenneth McMillan and the, and the slave boy and the heart plug. I remember that that upsetting me enormously, um, but I, I would have read the book again around that same time, and I've read it every few years since. Um, and you know, I've read obviously all, all all six of Herbert's as well over the years. So um, so yeah, that's my that's my Dune story. I, I read it far too young, and I think it probably you know planted some worms in my brain that have that have uh, that have lived there ever since. And uh, yeah, so right, being able to write this was 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 such a thrill. Yeah, that, that's great. I, I think a uh, few of us have, have come to Dune at a at a young age, and it's like as you go back to and revisit it over the years, you, you seem to get more and more out of it uh, each time. Oh, it, it, it's it's you know it's 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 like the spice. It it has a different flavor every time you you, you take it. You know. Yeah, yeah let, let's let's go ahead and uh, explore the worlds of Dune. Uh, the book, uh, yeah, really raises so many great topics of discussion. And like, as as I was going through and uh, getting questions and uh, you know getting inputs from from the other guys on, on the show, like th there are some topics that could be a full episode of in themselves. So we're really excited ch just to to dive in and kick off. Uh, so like, Garen, I'll let you go first with with your question. Yeah. So Tom, I <clears throat> I'm really glad that you've written this book. I I I first read Dune when I was 14, and that was the year that uh, Lynch's Dune came out in the theaters, and so I was just enraptured by the whole thing. It just dominated my my mind. <laughs> so a similar experience of experiencing it at a young age. Um, what I love about what you've done, and I knew someday someone would do this, and I'm I'm grateful that it's someone of your caliber that has done this. As I as I began reading it. As the years went on, I realized there are lots of reflections of reality and history and politics and ecology and philosophy are all weaved into this. And I believe that's one of the reasons we relate so closely to it. It resonates with something inside of us. So, Tom, tell me just what, what inspired you not only to write this book, but how did you approach the overwhelming amount of research in these different areas that you would need to tackle to be able to write this book? I stood on the on the shoulders of giants, essentially, um, uh, and and uh, and without being one myself. Um, uh, what inspired me to write the book was that was that um, Quarto Press, uh, Francis Lincoln Press, asked me to write this book. Um, as I said, I had um, written an article for Little White Lies, which is a um, beautiful um, kind of small press. There you go, um, London-based film mag. Um, and I wrote a piece on um, the kind of legacy of Dune um, and a, a, incorporating as well a kind of introduction into the, 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 the universe of Dune for, for those who might be approaching the Vienna film with no prior knowledge. Um, and um, the editor at, at, at Quarto uh, liked the piece and they'd had success with, with a similar book on, on Tolkien. Um, the, the book on Tolkien was more kind of geographical, but they were looking uh, around for kind of who would who, who would make a good follow up. And they, they fixed on Herbert and um, and they contacted me uh, and I said yes immediately. So. Uh, so, yes, that that was, you know, what inspired me was 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 someone saying, you write this, we'll publish it. I went, yes. Uh, so, yeah, didn't read much more than that. Um, as for research, I, I started by um, talking to uh, some people who, who who knew a lot more about the subject than I did, so I emailed um, uh, Daniel Imowa, um professor, and uh, Harris Durrani, and I got um, 
fair thoughts. Um, Daniel M.O.R. sent me an absolutely fantastic list of reading material, um, essays, some many of them scholarly, um, a lot of online stuff. And that was kind of where I started from. So I read those. And then I read Tim O'Reilly's book about Frank Herbert. I read um, The Maker of Dune. I read The Road to Dune. Um, I read a lot of blogs. I looked at Dune Info. Um, I looked at Dune Newsnet. I, uh, I, you know, and 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 read all six books again. And then, of course, I I read a lot of interviews with Frank Herbert. So we're really lucky in that there are loads of great interviews with him out there, um, both in print and on YouTube. There's there's um, that fantastic interview, hour long interview with, with with Willis McNally from the late sixties, um, and there are all kinds of other bits and pieces, and little bits of writing that he did. The sleeve notes for the uh, for the three albums of, of him reading Dune, I, I found really really quotable. Um, he, he he wrote he wrote great sleeve notes. Um, so I just read all of that, and then once I'd kind of made the lists of the topics that I wanted to look at. I just, Again, just did did a, did a similar thing. So I, I just read a lot of uh, history blogs. I read some history books. I um, read bits and pieces on science and and you know religious history and and eugenics and sci-fi books that he would have been influenced by. I, obviously, I read Brian Herbert's Dreamy of June. I should have said that much earlier because that was absolutely vital. Um, so yeah, you know, I just read. I read a lot, and so I mean, the, the the entire process was was very much, you know, as I said, this this book is entirely standing on the shoulders of giants. I I am taking the information that I found most interesting that that countless other people have accrued over, you know, the last six decades, and and passing it into into um accessible readable form that was you know that was that was my job here and and, and hopefully that's what i managed to do that's great yeah thanks thanks tom really really an amazing process so thank you and mark before uh, we get into to your questions uh, you also wrote um, a review of the dune on dunewsnet.com um and you were the first one who got an opportunity to read the book from our our team can you share a bit about your overall impressions yeah, sure. So first of all, this is the physical book, beautiful book by, um, I think, Intercity did the design of this. And it's got a lovely sand varnish on the cover, which gives it a beautiful bit of texture. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeously laid out inside. Lots of colour images, um, it's lovely font and layout in there. So it's a very easy to read. Uh, it's not some sort of massive uh, history tome that you're going to wade through. But the amount of information in there uh, and the understanding that you'll get of from greater understanding that you'll get of Frank Herbert's Dune and where his ideas came from uh, is absolutely superb. So congratulations, Tom. It's a great read. One of my favourite bits of information in the book that I didn't know before was that uh, the semantic abilities of the Bene Gesserit with the voice uh, took its origins from Frank Herbert's uh, ghostwriter or copywriter on uh, what was it? Um, Language of Thought in Action from 1949. Uh, so I'm just wondering, what was your favourite um, discovery uh, in the book while right doing the research? And was there anything that truly surprised you? Uh, I don't know if he specifically worked on uh, on Language in Thought and Action. He definitely ghost wrote for S.I. Hayakawa, who wrote it. Uh, whether he worked on that book specifically or just on articles for him, I'm not completely sure. Um but yeah, you know, there were so many uh, revelations. Um, I guess the, the the thing that I enjoyed most researching was was the history. So, uh, particularly the Islamic history. So you've got the history of uh, of the Mahdi, um, who who led a, an uprising in in Sudan against um, the, the the Egyptians and the, and, and the British. You've got uh, Imam Shamil, who led an uprising in the Caucasus Mountains against Russian. Colonialism. You've got Ibn Khaldun, who who um, basically invented the, the 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 science of sociology um, and inspired Ronald Reagan, as well as inspiring Frank Herbert and a, a million other people. Um, you've got these, you know, Turkish Janissary armies. These these kind of kidnapped children um, drilled to become, you know, the world's most fearsome fighting force. 
And, you know, I learned history at school and I studied history at, um, at, at sixth form college, but I didn't get any of this stuff. You know, I didn't learn about OPEC. Um, and, you know, it's way more interesting than the stuff I, I, I did learn. And, uh, it's really, it was just really fascinating and exciting to me to read about all these, the, you know, these revolutions and these battles and, you know, these amazing uprisings that, that Frank Herbert drew on when he was creating, um, the Fremen. Um, and you know, if you learn any, if you ever learn any of that, that stuff, it's always strictly from a Western perspective. So it was nice to kind of just go out on the internet and, and, and see what I could kind of discover. And I also, the other thing that I really, really enjoyed was just learning about Frank Herbert himself. Um, and not just from, from reading Dreamy of Dune, the, the, that was very much the kind of the first thing that I, I think it was the, maybe the first thing that I read, um, apart from obviously the Dune books themselves. I think Dreamy of Dune was maybe the first thing. But learning about him uh, as a person and uh, as a political thinker, you know, I'm a gigantic woke, woke lefty socialist, um, and Frank Herbert definitely wasn't those things. So, um, you know, it was really fascinating to kind of learn about his politics. And I think we would have agreed on quite a number of things. Um, I think we would have disagreed strongly on others, but I also think that we could have had a conversation about it. I think he was a very open-minded political thinker. Um, and, um, you know, you could see how his politics changed over his lifetime. I think that's probably something we'll come back to in this conversation. Um, you know, he had very, he had, he had very complex and very idiosyncratic political views. And I find that fascinating. You know, he wasn't someone who, was happy just to be told uh, what to think. He he absolutely sought things out for himself and was willing to change his mind. Um, and, you know, the, the, I think this has allowed Dune, which I think is definitely a political work, um, I th it's allowed Dune to be claimed by everyone from kind of woke lefty socialists like me um, and, you know, freedom loving uh, First Nations people and, you know, drug advocates and climate advocates to kind of, you know, gibbering swivel eyed fascist nutcases like Richard Spencer, who somehow think because they're not very bright that Dune reflects the things that they believe. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just fascinating the kind of spectrum of, 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 of political opinion, not just in, in Frank Herbert's kind of head and in his history, but in Dune and in the kind of, uh, the legacy of Dune. It's, it's, it, I find all of that stuff just absolutely fascinating. Um, so yeah, the, the, those were kind of the things that, that really kind of grabbed me, but there, you know, I could, I could list 10 others. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a great book and it's a sort of book that, you know, if you've got kids who are interested in, June, then it's a great sort of uh, gateway drug to get him into learning more about history. I, I certainly wish I had something like this when I was growing up as a kid. Um, it's much better than sort of the dry r learning dates uh, by rote kind of thing. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I tried to make it as approachable and you know, you know, reader friendly as possible while dealing with some fairly obscure. Um, corners of, of of history so so i'm you know i'm really pleased to hear you say that yeah so there's a lot of real world influences uh, that you detail in the book uh, were there any from june that you didn't include because um you couldn't find a good uh, a good um real world example and were you tempted to include any from the later books such as golas and stone burners um i i, I think uh, i i I, maybe I should have, I should have gone, I should have done Golas, thinking about it afterwards. You know, I had a limited word count. Um, we had to fit this within a certain size of book and with a certain number of illustrations to make it look as beautiful as it does. So I did have a limited word count. Um, so I had to prioritise, and my priority definitely was with the first book because it's the one that's being adapted, it's the one that people know, and it's the one that I love the most. So um that it was it was a fairly easy um decision to make um you know what i didn't want to um to risk um alienating people by by going too deeply into into the later books I, i'll admit yeah and it's spoiler um, free as well for anyone who's not seen the or not read the other books as well which is great as well i think for yeah people who just yeah exactly it, 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 
it's as it's as user friendly as as possible. Um, that said, um, I do love Doom Messiah, and I and I think something on Golas would have been would have been really interesting. I I I didn't find anything in my research about them, so um, I guess maybe that's why it never came into my head <laughs> to include them. I do think that in the later books, um, Herbert stopped to a certain extent. Uh, either doing new research or using real world research to to inform what he's doing. I think a lot more of it came from his imagination or from the world that he'd already set up in Dune. I think I think you know you you can't really look at face dancers or or you know no rooms and and think well you know there's a, there's a, there's a real world they come out of they come naturally out of the story that he was already telling not necessarily out of out of uh, some kind of new real world research. Um, so, so yeah, I, I probably should have done Golas, but mm -hmm. other than that, I'm fine with what I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's always fascinating to connect so many of those names and wordings in Dune to these uh, real world locations and, and people and places. And um, yeah, a lot of science fiction and fantasy stories do tend to take influence in, you know, or, or cultures like historical events, um, I mean, like, like, um, yeah, there's there just a, a lot that can inspire uh, authors in, in that way. Um, but uh, like a lot of those those works then end up sort of inventing their their own names or like uh, you know coming up with their own languages, coming up with with like a completely different world, like with you know like alien sound, sounding names or like however they, they choose to approach it. So in the end, why do you believe that Frank Herbert opted to use these real names sometimes as is in in his uh, books? Um, I think it makes Dune feel more real. Um, and I think it's something that people do, you know, um, Mark and I grew up in, 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 in the same part of the world, not just the UK, but in, in, in the North, uh, I believe. So, um, it's, it's really, it, you know, when I was growing up, I found it fascinating that so many of the place names of the places around me that I grew up in, um, had, had, uh, towns named after them in the U.S., so, you know, you would watch movies and watch TV and you'd hear about Birmingham, you know, and, and, and we'd think, you'd think, yeah, but that's just Birmingham. Well, well you know, <laughs> they've stolen the name Birmingham. Or, you know, I grew up, a lot of my childhood was spent in York um, and I had a friend from New York. So, you know, I think it's, 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 you see it. People go to other places and they carry names with them. They carry the names of places and the names of people and the names of things. Um, and I think that that's something that would probably happen um, where it already has happened. I mean, we name stars and planets and craters and, you know, whatever after things that we know there's a crater named Dune. Um, so I think it's a, it's, it's absolutely, if, if you're, if you're creating a world, which is supposed to be um, a future, a human future, uh, you know, an earth based future uh, or an earth derived future, then it makes complete sense to me that, that, that words and phrases and names, um, would survive. And it just, it, and it just makes the whole thing more approachable. So, you know, there's, there's kind of a strangeness and a, and a, and a normality, um, living, living side by side. And it makes the whole world just feel more convincing and more lived in. Um, it, it, it definitely works, works for me. One of the more controversial themes that Frank Herbert explored in Dune is eugenics, uh, and that's of course a central plot uh, point. Um, like when the, with the Bene Gesserit Order's uh, breeding program, like over the millennia, how they're working towards the Quisit Hadrak. Uh, considering the real-world connotations, though, like even decades before Dune being published, it was already a controversial topic. Uh, what do you see as being Herbert's ultimate message on this topic? I mean, it's clear that in the universe of Dune. Eugenics is real. Yeah. So eugenics is a science. It's a thing. It exists. Um, people have used it in order to, um, to, to, to breed the Kwisatz Haderach. But I don't think that that, you know, obviously, as, as you kind of implied, uh, in, in, in our reality, eugenics is not really science. It's pseudoscience at best. It's very dubious. It's very controversial. I don't think that that necessarily means that Frank Herbert believed in eugenics. Um, any more than I think Frank Herbert believed in the possibility of prescience. I think it was just, it's a what if, you know, what if someone could see into the future? What would that be like? What if eugenics could create um, a super, a, a, you know, a genetic superman? What if people engaged in a, a centuries long breeding program? What would that 
look like. I think it, you know he's he's asking questions. I don't know if he, he necessarily would have believed in in eugenics. Um, you know, and and you know, and, and the answer to those what ifs. Uh, the answer to the what if about eugenics, just as the answer to the what if about prescience is a complete catastrophe. You know, um, the answer to what if a man could see everything in the future is he would be utterly, utterly miserable and a monster. And the answer to um, what if people could really use eugenics to create a Superman is that Superman would be really miserable and a monster um, and the galaxy would suffer for it. So, um, you know, again, going back to those people who who see Herbert's use of eugenics as somehow backing up their ideas of the inherent genetic superiority superiority of certain um, humans over certain other humans. Uh, you know, jog on, it's nonsense. Um, I don't think Frank Herbert would have uh, uh, listened to them for a moment, um, uh, and, and and I don't intend to either. <laughs> Tom, I, I uh, consider myself to be decently educated in, in history. And when I'm reading Dune, which I do every few years, um, my mind will often uh, flip to, you know, what perhaps was the inspiration uh, on this particular element that I'm reading in the book right now. I will admit, though, I, I'm and embarrassed to say, I never did consider how Shakespeare's plays uh, may have influenced, uh, particularly like uh, Richard III or Macbeth, um, and so when, when you, when I read that part of your book, um, I just was just kind of, uh, disappointed in myself really that I had never considered that because there, there's so much influence that I can see there, particularly with Macbeth. Will you just talk a little bit more about how Macbeth influenced, uh, Dune as we know it? Yeah. So, I mean, that was, uh, that was very much an observation of, of, of Brian Herbert's, you know, he, he talks about how. His father loved Shakespeare, read all the the, the plays as, as as a boy, um, and you know that he he makes the point that the, the kind of castles of Caladan very much feel like you know an Elsinore. They have that kind of vibe, um, and the the political intrigue in Dune, the plans within plans within plans. There's a lot of that in 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 Macbeth in Richard the Third. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I think. Every writer of, um, of 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 the last five six hundred years, whatever it is, is influenced by Shakespeare. Um, I think it's particularly strong in 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 Frank Herbert because I think he was um, a voracious reader and an extre- you know, and, and a great mind sponge. You know, he 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 would have absorbed all of that stuff very very young. Um, so you know how how conscious it would have been. Um, him, him, kind of using a name like Duncan, um, obviously a key character in Macbeth and a key character in in, in Dune. I don't know, but um, certainly, uh, the, you know, there are elements of 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 Shakespeare's plays all over. I mean, you know, and witches as well. Yeah. You know, that's another thing that 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 transfers from from Macbeth into Dune, which is prescience. Um, and as somebody pointed out in an article that I read, the name of which escapes me, and I apologise to the to the author now. Um, one of the really interesting things that Frank Herbert does in Dune is that he foreshadows, or even spoilers, things that are going to happen further down the line. In the same way that um, solilo- soliloquies and, and opening speeches in Shakespeare often give you an inkling, or even you know an idea of exactly what you know Romeo and Juliet, you know from the first few lines of the play that that they're going to die. Um, spoiler alert to anyone who hasn't read Romeo and Juliet. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and he does the same with 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 Yui. You know, a thousand deaths were not enough for Yui. Um, so yes, uh, you know, I think he 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 borrowed from Shakespeare all over the map. Yeah, that's really fun. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the the chapter on the Fremen. Uh, I, I really learned a lot from that, and I think. Uh, most readers have been influenced or, or rather been aware of the influence of Arabic culture uh, on the Fremen. Uh, there's a lot of correlation there. But I, I, for me at least, and I wonder if other readers may be less familiar with the significant effect of Native American tribes, which you highlight in that chapter. Um, and um, would you say that uh, that influence of the Native American culture was was a result of Herbert's friendships and the relationships with First Nations people he had there, and and maybe also a, a broader interest in ecology and nature that, 
that, that led him to include that in the Fremen culture. What are your thoughts? Um, well, I think that um, the ecology came from the Native Americans and not the other way around. Um, and, and again, I, I have to absolutely credit Daniel M. who wrote a wonderful essay called The Quileute Dune, all about Frank Herbert's connections with the, with, with the Quileute tribe uh, uh, of of the area in which he grew up around kind of Northern Oregon. Um, so, you know, as, as you read in Dreamer of Dune, um, Frank Herbert had a friendship with an older uh, Native American man um, called Henry Martin when he was, when he was quite young, who kind of taught him to hunt and fish uh, and that kind of stuff. I think probably that story is a little romanticized, but I think the, the basis of it is true. And then later, um, around the time that he met Beverly, he met a man called Howard Hansen, who would become Brian's godfather and best man at their wedding. And uh, he uh, uh, was also closely connected to, though not a member of the, the, the Quileute tribe. And he, I think, was the um, was the basis of, of, to a large extent, of Frank Herbert's interest in ecology and climate. So what Daniel Imoir points out in his essay was that... Um, Early on in his career, Frank Herbert worked for logging companies. He worked for two Republican senators, at least one of whom was, um, you know, definitely a, a burn the forest and ask questions later kind of guy. Um, so uh, I think it was from Howard Hansen, who was himself an ecologist and, and, a, and a believer in um, in in kind of living at one with 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 the natural world, uh, that Frank Herbert. Um, Got his a lot of his ideas about the climate um, and the holistic nature of of, of of ecology. So yeah, you know, I think um, I and, and of course he, you know, there, there, there's a lot of, of Native American stuff in the Fremen. Um, the 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 idea of using uh, um, mind expanding drugs in in rituals. I mean, that's not exclusive to Native American people. It's 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 uh, in in First Nations tribes around the world, but it's it's something we very much associate with with Native American people. So yeah, I, you know, I, and and uh, you know, later after Dune was published, he he very much took up the cause um, of, of Native American freedom, and he 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 um, he spoke to and wrote articles about Native American people who were um, fighting for their for their freedom and their rights in the in the kind of late 60s and 70s. So yeah, I, I don't think it can be uh, um, overstated how 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 important that culture was to Dune. Um, uh, you know, the the, the 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 Islamic and Arabic influence is huge, but I think that the Native American influence can't be can't be overlooked. And uh, Tom, you're you're just mentioning about the psychedelic uh, aspect of. Um... Uh, there as well. And uh, Dune, of course, describes those experiences like in connection with the spice, the spice intake. And uh, that's really interesting knowing uh, Herbert's political stance. You, you mentioned about like at one point he was in, in favor of legalizing drug usage, um, though, as we were mentioning earlier on, on the show, his views were sort of all over the map uh, in terms of <laughs> politics, if you approach it from he today's uh, landscape. <laughs> um, on, on the other hand, like he also like you, you had a quote from him in a book where he clearly warned that, you know, drugs weren't the answer and that people who relied on too much they would lose their, their consciousness so when it came to dune do you believe he saw this i guess similar to the eugenics simply as something to explore as a what if or was he intending to make any present day statement i i suspect that it was a what if um you know i think i think it probably came out of that that the interest interest that we were just talking about in in tribal ritual and, and in first nations peoples i i have no no um, solid knowledge of that, but th that feels right to me that, that, that that's where his interest in kind of psychedelic drugs and in, and in ritual drug taking came from. Um, it's, it's amazing to me the way he writes about the psychedelic experience in Dune because according to himself and according to Brian, um, he'd, he'd never had like a, a powerfully psychedelic experience. He'd, he'd, he'd taken, you know, he'd ha had a couple of minor drug experiences, but nothing nothing serious and and yeah he writes about it in, in with such clarity and, and and um in such detail it's 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 extraordinary so yes he did say in interviews that that he thought that drug use was it was a dead end um but he also clearly believed that um that, that there were avenues and pathways in the mind that could be opened through the use of of psychedelics and and you know mind expanding substances 
Um, and yeah, I, you know, I do think it does to some extent come back to the same idea as as, as we talked about with eugenics and ESP. You know, it, it, it's a what if, what if using this specific mind expanding substance could unlock all these extraordinary things, these these histories, these genetic kind of histories. Um, and then he just, you know, he, he had that wonderful idea and, and, and he ran with it. You know, I, I may be wrong. I may be wrong about all of this stuff. I should, I should definitely say that. Um, but yes, uh, the, that, that's, that's what, what feels right to me. I think it was just, it was something that fascinated him. And so, uh, you know, and he put it into his book and, you know, so much of what's in June is just stuff that fascinated Frank Herbert. You know, he had such a, an interest in ESP. I don't think he believed in it. Particularly, I think maybe he wanted to. He was tempted to believe in it. I don't think he did. Um, and you know, the the, the the psychedelic thing is 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 the same. It's just you know, it, it's it's just what if? What if this this stuff was as wonderful as everyone says it is? Um, what if it could do all these incredible things? Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's it's great. When you were writing your book, um, you you cover sort of the pop culture, uh, the influence of Dune on pop culture and the various music albums that have been influenced by Frank Herbert's work. Were there any albums that you listened to, Dune-related or otherwise, that you listened to while working on this project? Well, yes, uh, most definitely. Uh, Zed, is it Visions of Dune by Zed? It was uh, B- uh, Bernard, I have no idea how to pronounce his surname. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. French or Belgian synthesizer wizard from the kind of late seventies who made an entire Dune themed album. It's great. It's really droney and kind of cosmic. Um, and uh, there are a couple of, uh, there's, a, there's another synthesizer album, Richard Pinas uh, made it, made a, a, a Dune inspired synthesizer album around the same time. Uh, really weird that these kind of, there, there was kind of three Dune inspired kind of cosmic rock slash synth albums all came out around the same time and they're all super listenable and weird um i didn't know about the fat boy slim reference that was one that came as a surprise to me that in weapon of choice he says um walk out of rhythm it won't attract the worm very very odd uh thing to just drop into an otherwise completely unrelated so well, and no, then you know the, walking as the emperor it's perhaps not as unrelated well yeah exactly it kind of comes back around doesn't it uh everything's connected um and uh yeah you know I, I i kind of i was i was expecting the metal stuff i think the the lyrics to i hadn't read the lyrics to iron maidens uh, what was originally named dune and, and had had to become to tame a land because frank herbert's people uh clearly frank herbert wrote them a, a, a pissy letter and said, we don't like Iron Maiden, go away. Um, but the lyrics are absolutely hilarious. It's clear that they had no idea what they were reading at all. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the music stuff's uh, fascinating. And Grimes, that was another one that came out of nowhere I had no idea about. Uh, very weird. Her, her debut album, Geedy Primes, really strange. Yeah, uh, misspelt as well, which yes. just, uh, really yeah. annoys me. For, you have to annoy uh, the hell out no of everyone. Reason. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we've got June part two coming out in five months time as opposed to the three weeks time it should have been. Um, slightly annoyed about that as well. Um, <laughs> uh, too. So, um, I'm just wondering, uh, how do you feel that Denny Villeneuve has uh, managed to incorporate the many layers of June in his film so far? Um, I don't think he has. I think he's chosen the layers that he wants to incorporate and um, incorporated them. And I think he's done a very good job of it. Um, I'm looking, I'm looking, forward to part two because however much i i am fond of the, the the lynch movie the second i mean it's not even the second half everything's crammed into the last sort of 50 minutes of the film and it's and it's just this kind of you know they slam through the the, the last part of the book in a, in a ludicrously short amount of time so i would like to see um to see that that section of the book done done justice as as for part one it, it may not have been the film that i wanted but i admire it um enormously it's 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 funny about maybe 10 12 years ago i actually sent an email to the um production company that then had the rights to do and i can't even remember the name of them <coughs> i think it was either just before or just after the peter berg film and i sent them an email what i expected to get out of it i'm not entirely sure i was working at time out at the time and i thought that you know, this gave me some cachet that they would actually listen to me, but it, it wasn't the case. But I said to them, you know, 
somebody should do a three part Dune. So you need to do the first two films of the first and second half of the first book. And then you do Dune Messiah as a third. And it's like The Godfather, you know, it's the rise and fall of Paul Atreides. You know, the first um, film, he's all young and, 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 and kind of optimistic. The second film is about his corruption. Um, and his kind of efforts to steer himself away from that corruption, and the the third film is about his 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 downfall, which is exactly the the, the, the kind of outline of the Godfather trilogy, um, well to some extent. And you know, I said to them, it, it it would it was around the time it was probably the second series of Game of Thrones had just been hugely popular. So I was saying, you know, Dune's got well, the one thing that the, the Lynch film didn't do, but that, that Dune's got in spades is all this kind of political intrigue all this palace intrigue you know people stabbing each other in the back and suspecting each other and you know Thufa suspects Jennifer uh, Jennifer Jessica of being a, a, a traitor and and you know all of this all of this stuff and that you know the Baron um, manipulates Yui to turn against the Atreides family and so you've got all this kind of great kind of castle intrigue stuff and you know you could you could uh, you could really kind of draw on the kind of the popularity of Game of Thrones and kind of do all this kind of bring this kind of backstabby stuff to the fore. Uh, and they never got back to me, obviously. Um, but here we are looking at a trilogy. But Villeneuve got rid of all of that stuff. So he junked all of that stuff. There is, there, you know, we, we, there is no political intrigue. We, we don't hear about Jessica being suspected of anything. I'm not even sure the word meant at, uh, comes up at all. Um, and instead, he chose to focus on the Paul and Jessica relationship, which I think is a really valid choice um, and probably made for a better film than than, than the one I would have made. Um, I wasn't expecting to make a film, by the way. I think I was just <laughs> kind of throwing ideas out and, and wondering what would come of it. Um, so and, and Villeneuve as a filmmaker, you know, you can see from from Arrival and from Blade Runner 2049 that he's very much a filmmaker who who focuses on mood and tone and vibes and, you know, and, 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 and what the Dune film does um, is focus very, very heavily on mood and tone. Um, and that's wonderful. And you get, and it, it creates this world that you can just step into. Um, so, and, you know, it looks absolutely stunning. It's so visually rich, you know, would I, take a little bit more backstory for Dr. Yui in exchange for a few less shots of Timothy Chalamet staring off into the distance? Yes, <laughs> I would personally, but it's still a wonderful film and I'm, and I'm, and I'm thrilled that it got made and it's just so beautiful. It's, it's so, so utterly beautiful um, in its costumes and its design. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to part two and, and, and seeing, um, what he does when when the story gets more thorny and actiony and uh, exciting. And finally, of course, um, there's 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 the issue of the kind of de-Islamification of the Fremen, which um, people are still discussing online. And which the more I learn about, the more I think they made the wrong choice. So I can see why they made it. It's probably the choice that I would have made on a knee-jerk reaction if I hadn't thought about it too much. Um, you, you know, you're frightened of, of, the, of the comeback that you can get. Um, so they kind of went for this sort of multi-ethnic mishmash with the Fremen. Um, but as so many people, um, notably Harris Durrani, but, but many others as well, have pointed out, why didn't they just speak to people? Why didn't they speak to Harris Durrani? Why didn't they speak to people of an Arabic background um, about how they feel about Dune and about how they feel about the Fremen, you know? Um, it, it would just have, have, have made for a much more authentic experience, I think, and, and it would have made for a Dune that was that was really um, that felt closer to the book and was approaching um, so a lot of more of the issues that, that Frank Herbert was dealing with in, in, a, in a more direct and interesting way. I completely, like I say, I completely see why they made that decision. It makes total sense to me. Um, but it makes sense to me from very much a you know white guy perspective. Um, and I think that if they'd been a little bolder and uh, a little more willing to listen to other opinions, I think it would have made for a richer experience. And um, uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think they, I think they made a mistake there. Um, I don't think it's a, a you know, I, I don't think it's a, a, a film destroying mistake. 
like I said, I, I really, really enjoyed the first part. I've watched it a number of times now and I will continue to do so. But I do think it was a mistake. Yeah, I understand you're a big Lynch fan as well. Uh, Lynch's Jim. I am. Fan. Yeah, I'm currently uh, wearing my um, I'm wearing oh, my Twin Peaks oh, yes. UK Festival yeah. T-shirt. I used to oh, used right. to be involved in used to be involved in the Twin Peaks uh, Festival in the UK. I, I I I was the one who did all the cast on stage cast Q and A. So I've done kind of Q and A's with half of the cast of Twin Peaks. So yes, I'm I'm a huge Lynch nerd. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, at university, uh, just a complete aside, at university, uh, we did the Twin Peakathon, which was 27 hours of Twin Peaks. Nice. Back and yeah, I've done it. With Firewalk with me. And if nice. you've not seen Firewalk with me after not sleeping for 27 hours, you've not seen <laughs> <laughs> You've not. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, Dune, Dune presents uh, an utopian uh, vision of ecological change. We see like a unified Fremen planetary community, like a, like, the whole world basically is is uh, cooperating together to change the face of Arrakis, and it's like a a plan you know that's going to take centuries or millennia to realize. And you know, e even though like the people who are currently alive uh, at the time they won't see the effects, they're still motivated to work towards that. In, in many ways, Herbert was ahead of his time um, in ex exploring uh, th this topic. B based on your research uh, that you did for this book, what do you believe uh, the author's intention and hopes were in em emphasizing this theme so much? I'm 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 not entirely sure. I, I I was I was fairly convinced that he went into it um, with with a, a, an ecological kind of message in mind. I, I listened to your podcast with Ryan Britt um, this afternoon, and he very much said that was something that Herbert uh, started speaking about later. I thought it was a great interview, by the way. The one thing that I will pick up on Ryan Britt is. No, Ursula Le Guin didn't write Dune, but she did write The World for World as Forest and The Left Hand of Darkness from the Dispossessed and uh, the Earthsea Trilogy. So she, she, do, she did OK. Um, but yes, he, he, he made the point that he thought that, um, that Herbert's just slightly rewrote history um, by saying that, that, that Dune was always intended to be an ecological novel and that uh, a lot of the material in the appendices was added um, to later versions. Uh, I, I honestly, I, I don't know enough of the details of this to, to, to say whether or not that's true. Um, I do think that the ecology is deeply rooted in 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 Dune, uh, whatever version you, you read. As you say, that this idea of the Fremen um, spending um, centuries. Uh, you know, uh, changing the climate of Arrakis, and I, I think he he was probably drawing as much on um, Percival Lowell, um, uh, kind of his observations of Mars, and um, um, the the kind of you know the John Carter stories of of the kind of fading Mars, the 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 the, 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 the encroaching deserts of Mars, um, and you know. It, uh, and on Rachel Carson and uh, you know all all of these all of these ideas, I do think that the, that the ecology was was inherent in 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 the first version. Again, you know, as as I've said, I think Dune is just a compendium of things that Frank Herbert was interested in, um, fitted into the framework of a of a, of a really fantastic story, um, and ecology was was one of them, alongside psychedelics, eugenics, ESP. Islamic history, Native American culture, all of these things, you know, they, they, they were just things that fascinated him. Um, and uh, ecology kind of, because of its prescience, I suppose, um, ecology was the one that sort of became taken up. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it, it's, it's just another, another one of June's many wonderful flavors. <laughs> So yeah, Tom, it's uh, it's been a great time talking with you on this Dune Talk show and hearing your insights on the the very many wonderful real world influences of, of Dune. Uh, so before we we go, um, uh, tell us a bit about where people can find more about you and your your book. And do you have any other uh, upcoming projects that you'd uh, you'd like to talk about? Um, no upcoming projects that I can talk about. I am writing a book in a similar vein to um, to the worlds of Dune. Um, not about Dune, about another author and his created world. So um, you'll hear about more about that in time. I'm also working on my first novel for adults. Um, so we'll see if anyone wants to publish that. 
Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, as you people can find me on uh, Twitter at Tom Huddleston underscore, they can find me on my website at tomhuddleston.co.uk. Um, and yeah, you know, um, seek out my other books. The, the the Flood World trilogy is the thing that I've written so far that I'm proudest of. So, you know, if you like dystopian adventure stories for aimed at readers kind of between sort of nine and 14, then, then, then give it a go. It's, it's, it's a, it's a rattling read. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, thank you so much for asking me to do this. It's been, it's been fantastic. Uh, no problem, Tom. Uh, thanks very much for, for joining us on this uh, special episode of June talk. Um, so once, once again, uh, it's, uh, worlds of June. Uh, highly recommended. Um, perfect for Christmas or Thanksgiving. Yet another book to add into your stocking stuffer. Um, I, and if anyone wants to follow me, I'm Mark at June Info on pretty much all the socials. You should also uh, very much buy Ryan Britt's book, which is fantastic. And the uh, a masterpiece in disarray. Author's name suddenly. There you go. Buy that one as well, because they're both uh, I've read them both in the last couple of weeks and they're both absolutely riveting Dune reads and they all, you know, all three books give readers something very, very different. So, um, yeah, read The Spice Must Flow, read A Masterpiece in Disarray, read The Worlds of Dune and then read all the Dune books again. Hey, Tom, thank you for your time. Uh, just really enjoying your book. Thank you for all your your time and research and investment into this. I think I think this needed to happen at some point. Um and I, I, I think it couldn't have gone, uh, been assigned to a, a better author. So, so thank you so much. And, uh, and if only I could grow a Frank Herbert beard like you have, Tom. So here we go. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your kind words. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's, it's, I guess it's, it's uh, yeah, it's getting pretty, pretty Herbert-esque at this point, actually. I, I could do with, uh, you know, trimming it back to sort of Jedi, Jedi length. Thanks again, uh, Tom. As mentioned, it's been a blast having you on, and uh, yeah, we, we wish you all, all the best with with uh, this book and your upcoming uh, projects as well. Looking forward to hear more about that in, in due time. And uh, yeah, th thank, thanks to all the um, the watchers and listeners of Dune Talk. It's been uh, always great uh, hearing from you, engaging with you in the, in the communities, and yeah, you can look forward to a lot more coming uh, soon from Dune Talk. Until then, take care. We hope you've enjoyed Dune Talk. Remember to like subscribe and turn on notifications so you know when the next episode drops stay tuned to doomnewsnet.com and add us to your social feeds be the first to hear breaking news and reviews